Well, good morning. Welcome to Church at Home with Glory Baptist Church in Aiken, Minnesota. So glad that you've taken a little bit of time out of your weekend to join us here for a time of worship. A couple of quick items and then we will get on into the sermon. First, if you haven't downloaded our bulletin or looked at that, it is online on our church's website. You'll find links here to that and would invite you to give that a look. It has various informational items about different uh, activities and ongoings in the church. It has a call to prayer, which is a, a weekly portion that has different things that you could pray for each day, uh, good things to go through there. Then, of course, it has our sermon notes. And if you're a person who likes to take notes during the sermon, we have sermon notes each and every week. Along with that um, is a reminder within that that uh, our church council met a week ago on Thursday and talked about returning to in-person worship in our church. We have selected next weekend, July 5th, to be our return to in-person worship. We will additionally be having online worship for those who choose not to come at that point, and that's fine. Uh, we want to be a blessing wherever you may choose to worship, and we don't want anybody to feel pressured that they have to be here, and we want to love you and serve you and, and create a worshipful environment and, and, and equip you to worship, whether it's at home or with us in person. So we're taking steps to get everything in place to be able to uh, have our service put here online so that you could worship along with us at the same time. There's going to be some limits to that. That's going to mean um, some of the things we can't broadcast include uh, commercial music and, and, a bunch, and things related to that with videos and other stuff. And so, so we'll have to be selective. We, we'll have some music that we're going to play here beforehand that we won't be able to broadcast. But we will try to have a, a song each week that we can broadcast that will enter us into that time of worship as we move into um, announcements and, and sermon and other things here. So we'll try to have a transition musically with that. Um, and then we'll encourage you, as, as we've been doing, uh, as you will see attached to this video, will include songs that we're using um, here at the church in person that you can go to YouTube and watch those videos and use those to worship at home. So trying to kind of cover all of our bases with that, we sent out in mail, uh, email, we've put on Facebook and on the church's website, the information about our return on July 5th, our, our heart behind it, some of the steps and plans that we have in place for it would encourage you Read that, look that through, think that through, and then uh, if you're comfortable, come join us for worship next Sunday here at Glory Baptist Church. Again, it'll be at 10.30 a.m. That's the time that we worship, and uh, we would love to have you here with us or join us online as well. number of different things to be in prayer for, and you'll find those, as I said, many of those come in our, our call to prayer. We have a spot on our church's website you can submit prayers. We have a, a prayer list that goes out. To different members uh, who have signed up for that. If you'd like to be part of that, you can talk to Ruth Eggstead and she can put you on that. When you come back to worship here, we do have our prayer wall at the front of our sanctuary where you can submit prayer requests there as well. Uh, there's a place on the wall to, to hang the public prayer requests and then there's a little box you can put private prayer requests in and we would love uh, to be able to pray for you and uh, be a blessing to you in that way. Lots of things to be in prayer for for the world. Um, our family of the week, Tom and Lori Rusev, and um, always somebody to be in prayer for, whether it's health concerns. Uh, many of us have been praying for Glow Carlson. Gloria uh, had, had a uh, stroke, and she's been on our prayer list and um, praying for her. Uh, Mark and Vicki Daniels' daughter, uh, Shelly, is uh, expecting a baby. We're praying for her. We're praying for Adrian Hurd, who's expecting a baby. Uh, a bunch of other people with other various health concerns, whether it's uh, we had heart surgeries or hernia surgeries or shoulder surgeries or cancer treatments or just lots of things that go on in, in our, our body of Christ and, and lots of things to be in prayer for. And so I would encourage you to be a people of prayer, praying for people who are mourning loss of family members, um, just all of that. There's so much for us to be in prayer for. Praising God for, for Thanksgiving um, thus far. As far as I know, nobody in our church has had COVID-19. That's a, a very much praiseworthy thing. Praise God for that and pray that it continues that way. Um, the reality is, as a church, we are coming back together to worship and in person. But if uh, there's a 
outbreak locally, we'll, we'll take some time off again until it's safe to gather back together again. And that's just the way of the world. And that's the way it's going to be. And we'll move forward and we'll figure it out and we'll make do. And in the middle of that, we're going to find ways to praise Jesus no matter where we are. And we're going to invite you to be part of that. So I'm going to pray and then I'm going to read just a little bit of scripture and then we're going to jump into the sermon. Again, I'm so glad you've joined us this morning for worship. I'm Pastor Chris Myros and it's a, a blessing to just be able to share God's word with you and and I am so thankful that uh, you are part of, of this. Uh, we do have online giving. You can go to our church's website for that. You'll find links uh, to, to that as well. And that's one of the easiest and primary ways people have been giving during this COVID crisis. You can certainly give by mailing a check or dropping it off at church. And we appreciate your support. That helps us continue to do the work of God. There's lots of great things that continue going on. Uh, supportive missionaries. We've been doing meals here at Glory Baptist Church. Uh, Roy and Ruth keep uh, keep that going and have been doing a tremendous job and it's been a real blessing. We've been feeding anywhere from 55 to 70 people a week um, on Wednesday evenings and I know they're being blessed by that and the food is fabulous and Roy of course is always a great cook and a willing servant so we're blessed to, to have him and then everybody else who's helped that delivering and carrying meals out and boxing stuff and all all that stuff has really been a blessing. So there's just lots of stuff. Even though we're at a distance, God is still working. God is still on the move. COVID-19 can't stop Jesus. And so uh, it's not going to stop us either. Let's pray. And then I'm going to read from Genesis 2. So if you don't have a Bible, grab one. Don't do it while I'm praying. Pray along with me. But grab a Bible and uh, pray with me. And then we will get going here. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time that you've given us to be together, the chance to be in your word, the chance to celebrate and worship. Pray, God, in this day that uh, you would truly renew us, that you would refresh us. Pray, God, in this day that we'd be reminded of the many blessings you have poured out upon us, that you have been so good to so many of us for so long. Even, even on days, Lord, where things don't seem good, uh, you have blessed us beyond measure, beyond belief, beyond certainly what we deserve. And we are truly thankful for that. We're thankful for your love. We're thank you, thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, who is the greatest gift we've ever been given. And God, we just praise you that he came to earth, that he was Emmanuel, that he walked among us, and that he came and lived a life we could not live and died a death we could not die to free us from our sin, that he went upon the cross on our behalf to pay our debt in full. Lord God, that mercy, that grace is humbling. It's amazing. And we are truly thankful for it. God, we pray for all of our brothers and sisters who, who are sick, who are hurting, who are struggling financially. The problems are physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. Lord, there's all sorts of things in this world that, that are not the way that you designed it to be, that you intended it to be, that you want it to be. But yet, we caused it to happen. Our sin has broken this world, God, and there is repercussions to it. And yet, God, you're working in it, and you're working to redeem it, and you tell us that someday you will restore it. And Lord, we are looking forward to that. And we are so thankful, God, that we can pray to you and know that you hear our prayers. We lift up those who are hurting, those who are lacking. We lift them up to you, Lord, and pray that they would find their peace in you, that they would find healing and comfort in you. God, guide their lives, guide all of our lives. And God, as we continue on in worship, just pray for your presence wherever you may find us, that where we are, they, there you may also be. And God, as we worship this morning, God, just be with us in an abundant way that we might truly marvel at your goodness, that we might know you more in this time that we have, and that from that, we would serve you better as we go forth. Lord, we thank you for your love. We praise you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, thanks for praying with me. And I'm just going to read a, a brief passage of Scripture, starting off in Genesis 2. I'm going to read Genesis 2, 1, 2, and 3. And then we will hop over into the sermon. It says, in my Bible, the seventh day that God rests. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work, that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all of his work that he had done in creation. 
This is God's Word. Well, we're working our way through the book of Genesis, or, or at least parts of it anyhow, and today I want to look at the Sabbath. And I know we've all heard that term before, and at some level, you might have an idea of what it means, but if you're like most people, you probably don't have a, a clear understanding of, of where it originated and what exactly it really means. So we're going to dig in onto that today, and I want to concentrate on this creation of the Sabbath as an ordinance. God establishes certain blessings and, and obligations for man at the very outset of his relationship with us. The very first words, in fact, out of God's mouth, the very first words uh, to ever hit man's eardrums were the words of God blessing him. And so this ordinance of the Sabbath is meant to be a blessing to us. And I'd like to look with you at uh, verse by verse this passage that we have here today. Uh, first of all, in, in the first verse there in Genesis 2, we see that the seventh day of creation marks the completion of God's special creative work. But that completion of God's work uh, of creation doesn't imply that, that God was then inactive. Uh, notice the words there uh, that... As it says, the heavens and the earth were completed and all of their hosts. Now we've already been told in Genesis 1, 1 and 2 that, that God created the heavens and the earth. But there's a, a new phrase added there in Genesis 2, 1. And all of their hosts, right? It's designed to express to us that the entirety of creation has been made. It's been filled out. It's been completed. That the work that God was doing and his creative act has been brought to conclusion. In this phrase, the, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all of their hosts, God is proclaiming to us the, the completion of his creative work uh, of the entire organized world. Look back at, at Genesis 1, 1, and 2 and, and see the contrast. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Emphasis on that, that first phrase, the earth was formless and void, right? It was without form. It was empty. Now in Genesis 2, 1, it says, thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all of their hosts. So we've gone from emptiness to fullness. We've gone from the beginning of creation to the completion of creation. And so in that, that phrase, creation is brought to a finish. The, the special creative work of God is done. Let me mention some, some interesting things. This same word, the same Hebrew word for finish, is used twice more in the Old Testament for important works that were brought to completion. If you're following along in your Bibles, keep your finger here in Genesis, but flip back a, a couple of pages into Exodus, to Exodus chapter 40. In Exodus chapter 40, we see a word that recorded about the completion of the tabernacle. Uh, you, you may know this story, and if you do, you know that for about 12 or 14 chapters before this, God has been giving instructions about the tabernacle and its contents and, and exactly how it is going to be made and who is going to make it. And it, he gives just very, very specific detail about all of this. And then in Exodus chapter 40, 33, we read this. And he, that is Moses, erected the court all around the tabernacle and the altar, and he hung up the veil for the gateway of the courts. Thus, Moses finished the work. The same term is used there of Moses completing this work at the tabernacle. This finished, that word. All that labor that had, uh, that had come before this, described in all of the preceding chapters, is brought to a, a culmination in his completion of that work. It is finished. He's finished it. The work is done. And the other one I want you to look at is over in 2 Chronicles. The same term is used there in 2 Chronicles 7, uh, verse 11. And, and, and this is right in the context of the Feast of Dedication of God's house, which, which Solomon had built. You might know this Old Testament story as well. And in 2 Chronicles 7, 11, 
uh, we read there, thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's palace and successfully completed all that he had planned on doing in the house of the Lord and in his palace. So the thing that he had set out to do was brought to a completion. Now, it should encourage us that God has brought to completion that which he set out to do at the beginning of creation. That's very important for our confidence that he's brought this to completion, that he's, that he's finished what he set out to do in, in this process because he's done the same thing in the process of our redemption. We need in this sinful world, in this fallen, broken world that we live, to be assured of the certainty and the completion of God's work of grace. And it's interesting that the terminology of finished, right, is applied as well in the New Testament. We've heard these words before. For instance, in, in John chapter 19, John 19.30, you're welcome to turn there with me. John records for us this word of the Lord Jesus. It says, when Jesus, therefore, had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now, those words are, are packed with significance, indicating that Christ has brought to completion that which was necessary for the work of our redemption. That is, to buy us back and to open up the way for us to be in fellowship with God. He has, he has brought that work of redemption to a close there on the cross. It is done. It's like a, a bill that has been paid in full. It's been marked off and, and, and no more will it be charged to our account. He has finished the, the work of redemption. And I want you to note that specifically with regard to the new creation as well, this comes into play. It's used again in the book of Revelation. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Revelation. Keep your finger still back in Genesis, because we're going back there. But turn with me to the book of Revelation, Revelation 21, 5 and 6. And actually, uh, we'll pick it up and start in verse 1. It's just, the context of it is the discussion of the new heaven and the new earth. And so it says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And notice again that immediately we, we, in the language of, of the original creation here, we're, we're right back there again. And what did God originally create? He created the heavens and the earth, of course. It's what we've been studying. And now in Revelation 21, in which we get to the, these, we, we get these constant echoes of Genesis here, especially in these first chapters. Listen to what John says here. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And, and for the first heaven and for the first earth had passed away, and there is, no, there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be among them, and he shall wipe every tear from their eyes, and there shall no longer be any death, and there shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, It is done, or it is finished. It has been done. It has been completed. It is finished. And then he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give life to one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. And so in this passage, we see that the finishing of the old creation and the establishment of the new creation by the Lord Jesus Christ, right? In the, in the very same language that we hear back in these previous verses. It is done. It is finished. It's been brought to completion. What, what God begins, he completes. He brings that work to conclusion. And that ought to bring us confidence when he promises that he will not leave us or forsake us. That the good work that he has begun in us, he will bring that to completion. That, that he really means that he's going to finish what he set out to do. 
And so here back in Genesis 2 and verse 1, his work of creation is done. But that doesn't mean that he ceases to work. That work is, is never to be done again, though, that creative act, never to be repeated. That portion of his work, it's done. That, that original foundation laying, right? That, that, that he, he's built the foundation. That work is never going to be relayed. The foundation has already been done. That work is finished. But God isn't finished working. He continues to work in various ways through his providence, his, his preserving, his governing over creation. And how do we know that? Well, the Bible tells us so, of course. We know specifically because Jesus tells us. Look at John 5.17. This is a verse we studied last year. And look at John 5.17. We'll look at that passage, actually. I'll get to that in a little moment. And, and know that, that God's Sabbath rest is not a, a rest of pure inactivity. Many have mistakenly thought that, right? That, that on the seventh day, God rested. Well, that means, well, he did nothing. No, that, that's not what that means. He's not immobilized on the Sabbath. It's, he's not been somehow, now he's not allowed to do any work, right? He's just resting from his creative works. God doesn't just go and sit by the pool and drink, you know, fruity drinks and say, well, day, it's my day off, so I don't have to work, right? No, it's just telling us here that his creative works have been brought to conclusion. And then in verse 2, we learn that that God rests from his creational labors on the seventh day. And we'll learn from the New Testament as well that he does this for our benefit. Look at verse 2 of Genesis chapter 2. By the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. So God's finished work of creation is, is sealed with the words. He rested, right? Cessation from his special activity of creating the heavens and the earth and everything that's in them, of course, is implied along with it. But again, that doesn't mean that, that God was somehow inactive. He continues to, to nurture his people and his creation. Uh, so let's look at a couple of those passages. I, I was beginning to mention one of those a second ago. Turn with me to, to John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, Jesus has been confronted by the Pharisees, right, for, for his Sabbath practice. You remember back in, in Jesus' time that, uh, that there was an emphasis in Israel on how to observe the Sabbath properly. And the way that you, you did this right was you had to refrain from doing all sorts of things. And the emphasis of the Sabbath was on what you didn't do. And Jesus' Sabbath gave the Pharisees fits because Jesus was constantly engaged, not only in activities of worship, but also in activities of mercy, of service, of love and ministry. And that gave the Pharisees fits. And so they questioned his Sabbath practice in John 5 after he had healed a man on the Sabbath day. Look with me at John 5, beginning in verse 15. It says, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. Now, what's Jesus saying there? He's saying that, that God's Sabbath activity has not been one of simply cessation from doing anything. He's actually been actively involved in, in, in a different kind of work. He's been active throughout. Even though the Sabbath does imply a, a rest, he's continued other forms of work. Other things continue going on. Notice again in Jesus' words here, this comes from Mark chapter 2. Uh, Mark 2 verses 27 and 28. He preserves the, the same creational pattern that we see expressed in Genesis 2, verse 3, coming up in a little bit. In Genesis 2, 3, we're told that, that God blesses and makes holy the Sabbath day. He blesses and, and sanctifies the Sabbath day so that the Sabbath is both a blessing as well as a holy day. And now Jesus 
preserves that exact pattern in Mark 2, 27 and 28. He says again that the, the Sabbath is blessed and it's to be hallowed. It's to be holy. Look at his words and, and see how these correspond exactly in verse 27. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, Pharisees, you, you, the Pharisees, you guys, you guys don't understand. You, you're missing it. Pharisees, the Pharisees don't understand that, that God made the Sabbath to be a blessing and, and not a curse and not a burden. And then he goes on to say in verse 28, so the son of man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. So it's a day that's set apart. It's still holy. In fact, it's come to be called the Lord's Day, as we know, in, in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. And so it's both blessed and holy. And again, this indicates that it's a, a day in which God is concerned about his people and he wants to nurture them and to bless them and to love them. God is still active in the Sabbath. He's not, again, like I said, just sitting poolside doing nothing. No, God is still active and involved in his creation. He's just not creating new works. The creation time has finished. And then we get to again in, into the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is always an interesting book. There's a lot there. It's a lot to chew through if you've not read the book of Hebrews. It's an interesting book and uh, debated in lots of different areas, but, but fascinating book to read. And in Hebrews chapter 3, and, and, and you may just want to kind of scan over this part. Uh, I'm not going to go and read all of it because it's a lengthy part. But Hebrews 3, 7, all the way down to Hebrews 4, 11. Um, I, I don't want to go into all the details because it'll take me off track. But, but in this section here, it, it, it's stressed that God's Sabbath was not only a gift to mankind, but that in his giving us the Sabbath, it's, it's a promise for believers for a rest, which we experience now only just in part. And that we can look forward to in the future an even greater Sabbath, an even, even greater blessing of, of that Sabbath in the new heavens and in the new earth. And so God's Sabbath is entirely designed for the blessing and the nurturing of his people. And he's active in nurturing his people throughout the Sabbath, throughout all of time. The Sabbath is designed as a day for the nurturing of spiritual life, for worship, for service, for sharing in love. That is what the Sabbath was created for, to be a blessing to us. Then in Genesis 2, 3, I want to point out one other thing as I close today. In Genesis 2, 3, we see that, that God set apart, that he especially favored the seventh day because of his rest from this creative work. Look at, look at those words. Then God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because in it, he rested from all of his work, which God had created and made. Because of his resting, which he did for our benefit, God favored, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. He hallowed it. He made it a holy day that seventh day. And when I say that he blessed that seventh day, that Sabbath day, I, I, I mean that he made it an effective means of blessing for all who receive it, for all who get it, for all who experience it, for all who are sanctified by it, but all, all who, who get to on that Sabbath get to find rest, get to come into worship, get to have an opportunity to love and serve others as God has done to us. God has made that, that day of the Sabbath as a, a means of grace, and he sanctified it. And when I say he sanctified it, I mean that he consecrated it. He, he set it apart. He, he, he made it holy for us to use as a day unto the Lord. That, that, that this is an opportunity, a, a way of, of blessing back to God. Now, now think of this. Remember back to who first heard those words of Moses in Genesis. That they already had Sabbath. Moses isn't telling this to them in order to, to argue that they ought to have a Sabbath. He's telling them this in order to explain to them where their Sabbath comes from. 
So in other words, he's saying, this idea which we, we've heard given on Mount Sinai in the Ten Commandments, it's not a new idea. We already had it before that. This idea is, is rooted all the way back from the time of creation, rooted in a blessing that God gave us all the way back when he created it. He's just reiterating it for us again now. And his point is that God did not need to rest as if he were like physically exhausted. Man, I, I've been working on the earth for six days and now I need to take a break, right? Uh, that's, not, that's not how God operates, right? God didn't get tired. Uh, that's not our God. If it was our God, he wouldn't be God. That's not God. So, so Moses' point isn't that he was physically exhausted, but, but his pattern of work and rest in six days and then the seventh day of rest was designed specifically for us because he knew that we needed that rest from our labor. And, and so in creating the Sabbath, it's a memorial of God's blessing to us in creation. And of course, it's a memorial also of the rest that we will have coming for us in the time of our redemption in the new earth and in the new heavens and the new earth. And notice how in Exodus and both Deuteronomy as well, in the two passages where they record the Ten Commandments, that both of those things are stressed. Look at those real quickly. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 is, is where you'll find that, uh, starting in verse 8. God explains the Sabbath day. Uh, and verse 8 following all the way into verse 11. And there Moses stresses this. It says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. And therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. In other words, there Moses says that the reason that we're to remember the Sabbath day is because God established this in creation. This is what he did in creation. Then, then just turn over a little bit further back into the Bible. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 5. There he, he stresses God's redemptive work. In Deuteronomy 5, uh, beginning of verse 13, the command for the Sabbath day concludes this way. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Because God freed Israel from slavery, they were to observe the day. So his work is grounded both in creation as well as in redemption. And remember, this is at this point in the story in, in, in Deuteronomy there, this is a, a nation made of, of former slaves, right? Whose lives had been completely controlled by those who owned them in Egypt. And now God is saying in his, in his Sabbath commandment, I command you to have seven and a half weeks of mandatory vacation each and every year. That's what it works out to be, right? 52 weeks, take a day off every week. Seven and a half weeks in which you cease the, the, the regular labors of your six days of work and you give yourself to worship, to rest, to service, to loving others. Deeds of necessity and mercy. And, and imagine what a blessing that would have been to a nation of people who had been slaves. There were, their response wouldn't have been our, our customary, you know, oh no, all right, just another day. It would have been, we get a day off every week? A day where we can worship God? A day where we can love others and serve others? This is incredible. This is wonderful, right? We, we get that every single week? Oh my goodness, this, what a blessing, right? Oftentimes, we don't respond that way. We don't see that blessing. We, we don't see that. And we miss out if we are not seeing it like that. And so the Lord's day is provided for them as a blessing. And we ought to be equally excited by this provision of the Lord for us on the Lord's day, on the Sabbath. If you haven't studied this before, or, or maybe you have, but some of this is still a bit new to you, I challenge you, give it some thought. How do you celebrate and experience the Sabbath? Are you finding ways to, 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 to connect with God, to refresh your spirit, to refresh your soul, to refresh your body? Are you serving others? That's what 
God means and intends for us when he gives us the Sabbath. Now the Sabbath for many people is Sunday. It doesn't have to be on Sunday. Most of us it is, but not everyone. We don't want to become legalistic about that. But that time that you're setting apart, that you're, 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 you're setting aside that rest, that rebalance, that refresh. How do you think about that? How do you use that? How do you feel about that? Do you see that as a time of blessing? I challenge you, think about that this week. And as God works on it in you, as God works on your heart, examine how you celebrate him and worship and examine how you love others as he's loved you in this time of Sabbath, of renewal, of refreshing that he's given you. And then as you find ways to celebrate him and to love others, make much of Jesus in the midst of that and, and continue on growing in your faith and just see what amazing things God can do as you actively seek and work to experience fully the blessing, that Sabbath, that God intended in it for you, what it could be. Think about that this week and find ways to use it to God's glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we get to hear from you each and every week or each and every day, in fact, Lord, as we read our Bibles and we study it. And, and God, just pray that you would continue to work on our hearts and continue to ingrain in us this idea of you've created us for work and that work is not a bad thing. But then, God, you've also given us this gift of Sabbath. And that is also not a bad thing. And that in that God and in that time that we are to worship and serve and love and rest and reflect and renew. And God, I just pray for each and every one of us, we, we would find opportunities to do that. Lord, it comes easier for some of us than others. God, I just pray that for all of us, though, we, we would take that seriously because you created us in a way that we need that. And God, it's not just about sitting poolside with fruity drinks. That's not exactly what the Sabbath was created. It's, it's great to do that. It's great to go out and enjoy your creation, to hang out in the boat. But it's also, Lord, a chance for us to grow spiritually and a chance for us to bless others as well. And so, God, may we do all of that to your glory as we Sabbath. And may it renew us. May it help us grow closer to you. May it strengthen us so that throughout the rest of the week, we might follow you better. Lord God, we thank you for your abundance of grace, the amazing blessings that you have given us. We are so glad that we get to be part of your creation and experience all that you have given to us. Lord, continue to be with us as we go about our week. We thank you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, we're so thankful that you've stopped in to join us here for worship at Glory Baptist Church starting next week on July 5th. We will have in-person worship here at the facilities at Glory Baptist Church, as well as putting our services online so that people have options. If you're comfortable and you feel ready, come join us. If you're not quite there yet, you're not ready, that's awesome. No judgment from any of us on that. Come when you are ready. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon, even if it's just seeing you digitally. And if we could bless you, love you, serve you, pray for you in some way, let us know. Leave us a comment. Send us a message. Contact us online. Give us a call. Smoke signals. Whatever you got. Whatever you got. Just let us know. We can't respond unless we know. But if we can do any of those things, we would love to do so. Thanks again for stopping. Wash your hands frequently. Make much of Jesus always. Stay awesome. And go and serve your king. God bless.